Well, what is speech, after all, except an instrument or a vehicle to convey a thought? And, of course, the more crisply and precisely and clearly it's done, the better. Because, after all, that is your instrument, particularly in public life. And you should be able to emphasize what you're going to say, but over and above everything else, clarity, and make it clear to the person who is listening. Well, Dirksen fits into that long line of uh, really remarkable people that have come from central Illinois. Uh, you mentioned Abraham Lincoln serving one term in Congress, 1847 to 1849, representing much of this area. Again, Lincoln as a lawyer, uh, riding the circuit in the same area. Then Dirksen coming and representing this area. Bob Michael representing this area. When I think about those individuals and how w within a really a small radius here in central Illinois, they all were, were you know, that's where they got their foundation as public officials. And again, I think it goes back to just the, the, the sense of community, the sense of family, the sense of uh, hard work and, and, and what that means. Um, and those were attributes that made Dirksen who he was. For uh, Senator Dirksen, uh, his ability to really uh, talk to people, engage people, really get people to understand uh, what the issues were. And then uh, the fact that, uh, you know, he was willing to be out there with the people and to come from one of the smallest communities in the congressional district, I think uh, really represented uh, the kind of values that people were looking for. Uh, but Dirksen, uh, I think, exemplifies getting in touch with his people. I think there are a number of excellent qualities of good leadership. And it's integrity, it's focus, it's vision, it's courage, it's empathy, truly important to have empathy, um, but it's also understanding the importance of strategic thinking. There's no question that once in those leadership positions, you don't just work with people in your own party, you work with people from both parties. See, politics is about 90% relationships. I think it's an underappreciated quality of Everett Dirksen that he was a hard worker. He took the responsibility of governing very seriously. I think the fact that he was so sensible, um, that he never lost sight of being a well-grounded person. Um, made all the difference in the world in the relationships that he made and the trust that he built. And I think that he was able to accomplish some of the most impactful policy during his time because of those relationships and that trust. Um, and to have genuine relationships with such a diverse group of people um, is something that we're hungry for these days. Civility in public service is central to any hope that we're ever going to accomplish anything because civility is necessary in order to have relationships and if you don't have relationships, you're not going to accomplish much. Everett Dirksen was an optimist. So he believed in the ability to persuade, in the um, ability to listen and have others listen to you. So I think his default style was to assume optimistically that he could be persuasive. His standard style was to assume the best in people, to approach them optimistically and hope for a good result. Willing to compromise, but not sell out his principles. So it's not personal, but you know, it is, it is principled. You, you have to understand that there are policy differences that we have and philosophic differences that we have, and those need to be expounded upon. But it doesn't need to be mean or nasty. It can still be civil. Dirksen very clearly understood the power of the spoken word, and he practiced it. And he was grounded in it. If, if you look at his report card from school, they took Latin, for example. He studied the Bible, he studied Abraham Lincoln, he read voraciously. So he was 
very aware of the power of the spoken word. People also um, remember him for his baritone voice and how powerful that voice was. When you, when you talk to people that either served or were around when, when Dirksen was there, I mean, the power of his voice and his persuasion was strong there. And Everett Dirksen had that talent uh, of how to use the spoken word to get things done. And in an era when uh, you know, the spoken word is used to attack versus influence, I, I think we should learn and take from him. There's power in words, and by using them in a, in a way that can precipitate change, there is a valuable lesson to be learned there. Well, the truth is that uh, under our system, no one person gets their own way. If there's 435 members of the House, not one of those members gets their own way. And in the Senate, not one of the 100 senators gets their own way. So in order to really solve the problem or find a solution, people need to listen to one another, they need to talk to one another, and then they need to begin to compromise. And compromise is not a bad word. Compromise is the way that you end up with the final piece of legislation. Well, when you think about uh, Everett Dirksen, uh, his ability to work across the aisle was um, very apparent when you look at his history. Uh, obviously, people know about his working relationship with LBJ, but also with lots of members of the Senate on both sides of the aisle. And obviously, the Civil Rights Act um, is probably the signature um, uh, piece of legislation that he was involved with, uh, and the courage that it took for him to support that uh, and be a part of that. I think the best legislation is always bipartisan legislation, because you know, what you have to realize, first of all, is that what you do affects people's lives in a very direct way. I grew up uh, in a segregated setting. You couldn't go to the, through the courthouse and drink out of the regular water fountain. Everything said for coloreds only or for whites only. Bathrooms, water fountains. You couldn't go in a restaurant. You couldn't go to sit down and order anything. You could go to a place like Cress's or Woolworth's we had then. And you could order something from the bar, but you had to stand and wait for it to be delivered, and you had to leave out the door to eat it. Uh, people who know me don't really know the scars that I have from segregation and forced integration is what I called it. To understand the importance of the civil rights legislation of 1964, I think you have to understand the context of where America was at that time. You had uh, you know, political polarity, as, as we often have, but it was Southern Democrats that were really resistant to passing the Civil Rights Bill. And so, uh, you know, this is shortly after the March on Washington, the famous, you know, Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream speech. And so the, the nation was really focused on uh, trying to get something done that uh, actually gave, you know, minorities, black people, civil rights. And so we had been building to this moment for a long time. And what a, a monumental, uh, piece of legislation that was. And it really took Everett Dirksen and the Midwest moderate Republicans to getting that done because the Southern Democrats weren't going to help. For me, it meant that we had to work together to get anything accomplished. Because were it still just African Americans or Negroes uh, at that time marching the streets, it was not moving where it needed to go. So it took other people crossing those lines and building bridges to be on that march together in order to make it happen. And here you have Everett Dirksen from Pekin, Illinois, becoming Senate Minority Leader, working with Lyndon Johnson to pass a civil rights bill, to give civil rights to all of our citizens. I think that is about as high an honor and achievement of leadership that I can think of uh, in many of the people that, that I have watched and paid attention to uh, in politics. That Dirksen-Johnson relationship gave birth in the 1960s to such landmark legislation as the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, our nation 
owes a debt to the respect between Everett Dirksen and Lyndon Johnson, a foundation to the success of politics in that era. Obviously during Dirksen and LBJ's era, they learned to work through it and, and get to um, moving the country forward. I mean, our democracy is predicated on working together. That's easier said than done, I think, today. Uh, we see that often, but it doesn't mean we can't keep working uh, to, to make the country um, better uh, and to make our democracy work better. And obviously I think um, LBJ and Dirksen are a good example of that. But whether or not we have continued on that journey at the pace we should have, I think it's an absolutely not. I thought we were on the path to that. Not necessarily that all of us were in the same place, but we had come to a place where we respected each other in the process. We were not so bold or emboldened to say the things and do the things that people are saying and doing now. I think in terms of where we're going, we have to look to our past and we have to understand that there's, there's some work to be done. You know, my first memory of, of Senator Dirksen was his funeral. And I remember as a young boy, I think I was nine or 10, um, and we were on our bicycles and we started at the Pekin Bridge and we rode our bicycles all the way out following funeral procession to the, to the cemetery. I think if I had been lucky enough to have been alive when he was and worked with him, I would have had tremendous respect for how he cared for his, his state uh, and how he cared for his district when he was in Congress. And um, he really respected the people that voted him into office. And to see someone who's an elected official to want to take really good care and appreciate the folks back home um, is, is special. Uh, and it really mattered for him. Dirksen um, w was emblematic of those values, and I think his success was due to those values, and him never forgetting where he came from. I think that's another thing when you read about Dirksen. Um, you know, he always had uh, a part of Pekin in him, uh, even at the highest levels of government. And as we look at Dirksen's legacy, his, um, his contributions to our community and to the country, um, truly he was a gatherer of people. He was admirable, he was strong, um, and he was trustworthy. And uh, we all want to be inspired by somebody like that. And Everett Dirksen was very successful. His life offers us timeless lessons. Lessons of leadership, of the value of truth, of civility, and of compromise, and the power of utilizing the spoken word to advance those principles. His wife, Luella, after his death, wrote a memoir about her husband entitled The Honorable Mr. Marigold. And in the epilogue of this book, she includes an excerpt from a speech that Dirksen had given on a warm September's day in 1961, wherein he says that all the major decisions in my life have been made here in Pekin. The determination to go to college, the decision to marry, the decision to become a candidate for the city council, the decision to become a candidate for Congress and to find public service at the national level, the decision to seek a seat in the Senate, despite the fact that those who counseled this course stated at one and the same time that it would be impossible to win. All these decisions were made here in my hometown and the inspiration which I received here from a saintly mother a devoted family, steadfast friends, the constant faith of teachers who taught me, the inspiration I found here in church, and the atmosphere of a quiet and well-ordered community were the forces which helped to fashion those decisions. And for these, I shall be always and eternally grateful.